Regulating facial recognition in businesses, e-commerce websites, and point-of-sales are hit with malware campaigns, and presidential candidate Beto O'Rourke was a hacker. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings! I am Shannon Morrison. This is ThreatWire from March 19, 2019, your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. Real quick, I would like to give a special shout out to my newest Patreon supporters this week, including Tom Joseph Mowry F84, Mr. Emit Cretone, Jay Pitchblack, and Kevin. And a special shout out to patron Caleb, who I met in person in San Francisco this weekend. So thank you so much for saying hello, Caleb. I would also like to say thanks to everyone who contributes to my content on all of my other alternative platforms. If you are not a big fan of Patreon, I know a lot of people out there aren't, but you want to support ThreatWire, you can hit up my website. It's snubsy.com support for a bunch of different ways that you can support my free content. So I'll put that link down in the show notes so you know. And if you're interested in supporting ThreatWire on Patreon, you can hit up patreon.com threatwire. And now onto the news. Last week on Thursday, U.S. Senators Roy Blunt, a Republican of Missouri, and Democratic Brian Schatz of Hawaii introduced a bipartisan bill called the Commercial Facial Recognition Privacy Act, which is aimed at facial recognition usage in businesses, and it strives to prevent businesses from using that data without customer knowledge or consent. Now, since venues such as concert halls, airports, police, casinos, even Madison Square Garden have started using facial recognition without any kind of regulation, this comes at a much needed time. And it's not just backed by two senators. Brad Smith, president of Microsoft, supports it as well. Now, both Blunt and Schatz are members of the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. And they both want more transparency and consumer choice when it comes to the collection of data through facial recognition. They believe believe this legislation would be an important step towards protecting the privacy and empowering consumers. Now, the context of the bill requires companies to notify consumers whenever facial recognition is being used, but also requires third-party testing and human review of the technologies prior to implementing them. So this is to address accuracy and bias, which are two very large concerns that have gained momentum in the past year. Redistribution and disseminating the data to third parties is restricted, and it must be consented to by the consumer. The bill also includes information for B2Bs, where in vendor of the technology, developers, storage servers of the data, and the types of implementation must fall within the guidelines for data controllers and processors. Facial recognition technology would also need to meet data security standards set by the FTC and NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Documentation must be provided to the end user that explains capabilities and limitations of the facial recognition technology being used in an easy to understand format. They also take into consideration some places where facial recognition is used legitimately, such as for identifying public figures in copyrighted material for theatrical release, or used for emergencies where a risk or of death or physical injury is also imminent. Now, some of the bill is kind of vague, but the lawmakers do plan to, if the bill is enacted, have the FTC, in consultation with NIST, provide descriptions about data security, retention standards, and a lot more. Several unrelated point-of-sale and e-commerce malware campaigns were reported last week, all of which just so happened to make the rounds in security news around Wednesday. Each of these campaigns has been actively used to target thousands of consumers and steal credit card data worldwide except for the very last one. The first report came from Group IB, which is a cybersecurity company, whose threat intelligence team discovered a GMO JS sniffer. Now they named it GMO since it uses a domain called gmo.il to send the data to after theft. GMO is an obfuscated skimmer whose main purpose is to detect Firebug or Google developer tools on a user's PC, both of which allow it to remain undetected. This JavaScript sniffer is used on e-commerce sites and it's been active since May. In total, more than 500,000 visitors may have been impacted from all of the infected sites. Now, it was first discovered on a sporting goods website, which is called fila.co.uk. It was infected since November of 2018, and at least 5,000 customers were hit. After that, several other sites were found to be infected, including junglemv.com, forshaw.com, absolutenewyork.com, Cajun Grocer, GetRxD, and Sharber, some of those of which I have never heard of. Those sites were still infected as of this recording. All of the infected sites are using the Magneto e 
e-commerce web platform and are located in the US and the UK. Now, the second malware campaign was found and reported on by Flashpoint, which is another cybersecurity company. This malware, which is dubbed DM Sniff, is being used on point of sales in restaurants and the entertainment industry, such as theaters. This uses a domain generation algorithm to create lists of command and control domains on the fly. Now, this allows attackers to continue to communicate back and forth with the malware and receive stolen data, even if law enforcement or web developers or the domain host take down a domain that they find is involved in the malware attack. DM Sniff has been active since 2016 and specifically is targeting small to medium-sized businesses, many of which use old and unupdated devices. It affects a point-of-sale device when attackers scan a target's network for vulnerabilities or when they brute force the network against SSH connections. In the case of DM Sniff, Flashpoint recommends that businesses update their appliances, strengthen network security, and set up alerts to detect the malware file called dmsnf.cfg. Now lastly is Glitch POS, which was reported on by Cisco Telus after spotting the malware on a crimeware forum. It was being sold for 250 USD and appeared on February 2nd. It is unknown how many criminals actually purchased it or are currently using the malware, but to work, the malware is spread through an email which contains a game and pictures of kittens. Yes, really. And it is protected via a packer developed by Visual Basic, and the packer is used to decode the real payload library in which Glitch POS resides. The malware is a memory grabber and it will connect to the command and control server, which is owned by the attacker, after finding and infecting a system. It receives tasks from the server and exfiltrates credit card numbers from the infected system's memory. The interesting part about Glitch POS is that it's apparently so easy to use. The malware comes with a video tutorial which shows any interested party how to use it, and it also has a very, very friendly looking user interface with pretty rainbow colors with an infected system system list and maps showing locations of clients. Cisco Talus recommends that businesses use advanced malware protection from their own company, along with setting up email security, using web security appliances, and firewalls. As consumers, there's almost no easy way to tell if a site or a point of sale system terminal is secure. E-commerce websites sometimes display secured by Visa or certified secured images, but those don't really mean anything when a web dev does not detect malicious JavaScript. Debit cards may not be protected against fraud but credit cards do allow you to do chargebacks, or they may alert you of suspicious charges. Some cards can alert you via text or phone if a charge is over X amount of money is attempted. Temporary cards with very small and set amounts of credit could be used for purchases online and in stores, but those do not come with some of the perks of membership like mileage or cash back. I would absolutely suggest keeping an eye on your statements each month to look for suspicious activity and be wary of any odd one-off sites whenever you're making those online purchases. Before we hit story number three, I wanted to say thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. If you are interested in getting access to a slew of extras and perks, even if it's just one or two bucks a month, hit that button to become a Patreon supporter because it all helps and it shows me that you appreciate the work that I'm putting in for this show. Also, a big thanks to our Hush Puppy Perk Level patrons for sending in their adorable fur baby photos. I love them, so keep them coming. Lastly for today, chosen by the Threatwire Patreon supporters, is our discussion about Beto O'Rourke, who was a hacker. No, I'm totally serious. Now, Beto O'Rourke has been hitting the news recently because he is a Democratic presidential candidate in the US and in the past few weeks has officially announced his run for the 2020 office. He wasn't well known until he ran for a US Senate seat back in 2018 in Texas, where Republican incumbent Ted Cruz held office and that year he defeated him. Now, according to recently published tweets in an upcoming book, O'Rourke was, as a teenager, a member of the Cult of the Dead Cow which is the oldest hacker group in U.S. history. Cult of the Dead Cow, aka CDC or CDC Communications, was originally founded in 1984 in Texas and ran a loose collective of BBS, which is bulletin board systems, across the U.S. The group is credited for creating the term 31337, which is leet speak for elite, or hacktivism, which is hacking for activism. O'Rourke was a member of the group until he went off to college at age 18. O'Rourke became interested in the hacking community in the 1980s when he created his own 
PBS called Taco Land, which was dedicated to punk music. And a short time after that, he met another bulletin board runner named Kevin Wheeler, who had recently moved to Texas. Wheeler founded the Cult of the Dead Cow, which O'Rourke became a member of. Not much is known about what kind of hacker shenanigans he got himself into, but he has said that he used techniques to get free long distance phone calls, which in the state of Texas would not be prosecuted for kids under 17. O'Rourke also claimed that he frequented sites that offered cracked, DRM-free games for his Apple computer. Now, the Cult of the Dead Cow had a lot of creative expression, which ties into one of O'Rourke's current hobbies, which is writing for his own blog. O'Rourke's history with the CDC is still a little foggy, but it does clear up some reasons why he supports or protests in the ways that he does. He supports net neutrality, for example, and he worked as a software entrepreneur and also used unconventional means to broadcast a house sit-in debate on gun control by streaming it to his Facebook page. He's also written for the CDC Bulletin, his own pieces to contribute to the creativity aspect, such as envisioning a world without money, and also writing a kind of upsetting fictional piece about running over school children with a car. O'Rourke also contributed to helping the only woman in the CDC gain her membership, but with that said, there was only one in the small group of 20 active members at the time. O'Rourke's identity and connection to the cult of the dead cow was kept secret after college when he went into politics. Now, while O'Rourke was not involved with the CDC when they released some of their more notable hacker exploits, he does seem to share many of the same beliefs. This is the first time that we know of that a hacker has been announced as a presidential hopeful, and probably not the last. Now, while many in the recent hacker community have already stated that he's got their vote, we should consider that this is only one part of O'Rourke. Voting records, legislative actions, and future considerations should all be included when choosing your favorite candidate. Vote smart. And with that, don't forget to like and subscribe. I am Shannon Morris, and I will see you next week on the internet.